Electrons are a fundamental particle that have a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31st kilograms and a charge of negative 1. Understanding the electron is essential to understanding chemistry. The behavior of an atom is determined by its relationship with its electrons, as an atom will change the number of electrons it has to become more stable. For example, atoms can steal electrons from each other, creating ions that stick together and form ionic bonds. Or they can share electrons, creating covalent bonds that fill their outer shell. To help us understand how and why these bonds form, we can look at how electrons behave and where they're located within the atom. Electrons can be found anywhere outside of an atom's nucleus, but as they pop in and out of existence, they're more likely to be found in some places over others. We can measure the areas that electrons have been around any given atom. This has created maps with defined shapes, which we call electron orbitals. Part of the behavior of an electron comes from a property called spin. This is a property with no macroscopic analog, meaning the electrons are not actually spinning. Rather, spin is used as a way to help describe an electron's angular momentum. Electrons can have an up or down spin, which we will represent using arrows. We can think of each electron orbital like a box that can hold a maximum of two electrons. Electrons can occupy an orbital individually or in pairs with different spins. This is called the Pauli exclusion principle, which we'll come back to later. These orbitals are grouped into shells based on their energies, which we can see using an electron orbital diagram. In this diagram, electron shells are labeled in order of increasing energy, using a number we call the principal quantum number, n. In each shell, there are different types of orbitals with different energy levels. These are labeled with the letters s, p, d, or f. The number of different orbital types increases with the shell number n. Shell 1 contains only s orbitals. Shell 2 contains s and p. Shell 3 contains s, p, and d, and so on. We indicate the shell in which the orbital is found by writing the shell number before the orbital letter. For example, the s orbital in shell 1 is labeled as the 1s orbital. The s, p, d, and f orbitals represent the different shapes and possible energies of where electrons can exist around an atom. s orbitals are spherically shaped. There can only be one s orbital per shell. Due to its spherical nature, there are no other orientations of the s orbital. p orbitals are dumbbell shaped. This allows us to have three p orbitals, which lie at 90 degree angles to each other, one on the x-axis, one on the y-axis, and one on the z-axis. d orbitals are mostly clover-shaped, like two p orbitals overlapped with each other. There's one unique standout that is shaped like a p orbital with a ring around it. In total, there are five d orbitals. f orbitals are the most uniquely shaped. There are seven f orbitals in total. We will see these the least. Orbitals of the same type in the same shell of an atom have equal energy. We call groups of equal energy orbitals subshells. Let's count the number of orbitals in each shell. Shell 1 only contains the 1s orbital. Shell 2 contains a 2s orbital and a 2p subshell with 3p orbitals. This gives shell 2 a total of 4 orbitals. Shell 3 contains a 3s orbital, 3 3p orbitals, and 5 3d orbitals, giving 9 orbitals in total. The pattern we see here shows that the number of orbitals within a shell is equal to the shell number n squared. The number of electrons in a neutral atom is equal to the atom's atomic number. These electrons will fill an atom's orbitals and subshells in a very particular way. The first of three guidelines that we will follow is called the Aufbau principle. This principle states that electrons enter subshells in order of increasing energy, meaning the 1s orbital is filled out first, followed by the 2s orbital, then the 2p subshell, then the 3s orbital, then the 3p subshell, and so on. We saw our next guideline a bit earlier. This was the Pauli exclusion principle, which again states that orbitals can hold no more than two electrons, which must have opposite spin. 
We see this in our electron orbital diagram, where orbitals with two electrons are shown as boxes with an up and down arrow. Take this orbital in 3p, for example. While electrons can enter the same orbital if they have opposite spin, this is not usually the most stable configuration. Consider electrons filling into the 3p sublevel. When two electrons are paired within the same orbital, they repel each other electrostatically. Hund's rule, our final guideline, states that due to this repulsion, electrons are placed in separate orbitals of a subshell if possible. Within a subshell, we would also like to maximize the spin of our electrons. It's more stable for an atom to contain electrons with the same spin, as opposite spin electrons, even in different orbitals, repel each other more strongly. Therefore, when we add electrons to a set of orbitals within a subshell, we will add the electrons to one orbital at a time, each with the same spin. When each orbital has one electron, we will then begin doubling up with electrons of opposite spin. The arrangement of electrons in an atom is called its electron configuration. This will show electron shells and subshells in order of increasing number and energy, with a superscript indicating the number of occupying electrons in each subshell. For example, a nitrogen atom's seven electrons have an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. We can see this in reference to the electron orbital diagram and the atom's Bohr model. While the electron orbital diagram matches identically to the configuration, we lose some information about our electrons when we solely rely on a Bohr model. So while this is a nice visual, the model is limited and doesn't tell us the whole story. What happens when an atom changes their number of electrons? When atoms gain or lose electrons, they form ions with positive or negative charges. These electrons are added or removed from an atom's highest energy orbital. For example, oxygen has eight electrons with an electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. When oxygen forms the oxide ion, it will gain two electrons, forming a charge of two minus. It will have a new electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, with the two extra electrons added to the 2p sublevel. For atoms with many subshells, it can become too time consuming to write out their full electron configuration. To get around this, we can recognize that the inner shells of an atom might share the electron configuration of a neutral noble gas, which have full shells of electrons. Take for example phosphorus and its electron configuration compared to its nearest noble gas of neon. We can see that the inner electron shells of phosphorus line up exactly with the full electron configuration of neon. We can therefore write the noble gas configuration of phosphorus as neon in square brackets, followed by 3s2, 3p3. Some subshells have similar energies despite being in different shells. Take for example 3d and 4s. Although the 4s orbital is in a further shell, it will usually fill before 3d. This is unusual to our typical pattern. To remember how electrons fill, we can draw a triangular version of our electron orbital diagram. By tracing diagonally through our diagram, we can track the filling order of an electron configuration. Let's test this with iron. Iron has the electron configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. When electrons are removed from an atom, they're taken from the highest energy subshell first. In a 3D metal such as iron, when the 4S and 3D subshells are occupied with electrons, the order of their energies switch. When iron forms the iron 3 plus ion, for example, electrons are removed from 4S and then 3D. This would change iron's electron configuration to end in 3S2, 3P6, 3D5, with the 4S orbital now empty. There are a couple more exceptions for how electrons fill electron orbitals. One outcome of Hund's rule in electron pair repulsion is that sometimes it's more stable for 3D and 4S orbitals to either be all singly occupied or completely filled. This is the case for chromium. Typical electron configuration rules would give an electron configuration ending in 4S2, 3D4. However, evidence has found that chromium's 4s and 3d orbitals are all singly filled, 
with its electron configuration actually ending in 4s1, 3d5. Conversely, we have copper. Typical guidelines would place copper's outer electrons in 4s2, 3d9. However, it's been found that copper's 3d subshell is fully occupied rather than 4s. Its electron configuration actually ends in 4s1, 3d10. In summary, the behavior of electrons forms the basis of most chemistry. Electrons dictate how atoms interact and how chemical reactions occur. The different ways of representing electrons helps us understand different aspects of their behavior. Bohr models, for example, give us an easy visual for electron shells and the size of atoms, whereas electron probability clouds show where electrons most likely exist and electron configurations give us an address for the orbitals and subshells that electrons fill. Using each of these models, we can better understand the foundation of how atoms bond and react with each other.